I just want to introduce myself. Um, my name is Sarah Potts. I'm an extension specialist at the University of Maryland. My office is at the Western Research Center um, in uh, Keatesville. So um, that's where you can find me if, uh, if you ever uh, are in that neck of the woods. Um, so also on the call today is Jeff Semler. He's our extension agent in Washington County, as well as um, Rachel Slattery might be joining us later. Um, she uh, works in extension um, uh, in the Department of Animal Science. So uh, we'll be going through um, a lot about calf management today, um, but if you have questions, again, please put them in the chat box. So why is this stage so important? Um, so you'll see a lot of times, uh, everyone's always talking about how important calf management is. Um, and that's because the first 24 hours are critical. Um, and, and this stage of life is really important because calves are really susceptible to many stressors, which can have lasting impacts. Um, so things like disease, parasites, uh, temperature stress, and things like that. And what we're finding out now is that a lot of these stressors that occur during early during life can have impacts that affect the calf um, later on down the road. So um, again, we really wanna make sure we're paying attention to this stage. And we're gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about the first 24 hours because that's where everything starts and that's where a lot of things can go wrong. Um, and if things are missed or not managed properly, they can have dramatic impacts on calf performance. And the first thing that I'm gonna harp on is colostrum. Um, colostrum is the first milk from the cow that is rich in antibodies, proteins, uh, as well as growth factors. Um, and it's really important to, to helping the calf develop its immune system. The calf is born basically with very little immunity um, and colostrum is important to help it develop its um, immunity to uh, various different types of um, pathogens. Um, its ability to absorb antibodies begins to decrease right after birth, so this figure here to the right is showing um, antibody absorption rate as the calf gets older, up to 24 hours of age. And you can see that it dramatically drops um, from zero to, uh, essentially it's mostly gone at 12 hours of, of life. And the old, old recommendation used to be, you know, feed colostrum within 12 hours, then it kind of moved back to six hours. And now it's uh, as close to birth as, you can, as, as possible. And I'll show you why in just a minute. Um, inadequate colostrum consumption can lead to poorly developed immunity. Uh, which can predispose a calf to calf scours, uh, respiratory diseases, as well as general unthriftiness and poor health. Um, in terms of colostrum delivery, um, as I mentioned, timing is critical. Again, the old, old you know, recommendation used to be within 12 hours of birth, then it kind of shifted to six, and now, that it, now the recommendations are as close to birth as possible. And this figure nicely illustrates as to why that is the recommendation. Uh, this is a recent study that was published, uh, I think two or three years ago, um, where they looked at the uh, antibody levels in the blood of calves as they got older, uh, up to two days of age. Um, and they looked at three different uh, colostrum feeding times. Uh, the first one was at zero, so right at birth, they were given colostrum. The second one was at six hours after birth, and the third one was at 12 hours after birth. So you can see there's a dramatic effect of timing of colostrum consumption on antibody levels in the blood, especially within that first day. And some, and some of those differences actually were sustained um, after, after day one. So again, that's why we say close to, as close to birth as possible. That is the recommendation for colostrum feeding. So the other thing that goes into a good colostrum program is quality. So what is good quality colostrum? Good quality colostrum, um, we usually will think in terms of antibody concentration. So we want that to be at least 50 milligrams of, uh, per mil of uh, antibody uh, concentrations. And we'll talk about that here shortly in terms of how you can evaluate that on the farm. But the other two factors that we oftentimes don't really think about in terms of colostrum quality have to do with how clean, quote unquote, clean that colostrum is. So a total bacteria count, we want that to be less than 100,000 uh, call for, uh, colony forming units per mil, and we want a coliform count less than 10,000 CFUs per mil. Um, so again, those are two things that we a lot of times don't really think about, and we don't really test those on farm, but if you suspect there's an issue with your colostrum program, then those might be areas to look at. 
Um, I really want to highlight the fact that visual appraisal of colostrum for quality is not reliable. That is typically what a lot of people do. They look at it and say, oh, it's really thick or it's you know, really dark, it's really high quality. Um, there's really no relationship between visual appearance and colostrum quality. So it's really important to use the tools that we're going to discuss here in a minute to help you assess um, antibody concentrations of your colostrum. I also want to note that um, feeding unpasteurized milk, including colostrum, can transfer diseases such as yonis or BLV uh, to calves. So um, that's another thing that might come up in, in terms of you know, cleanliness of the colostrum. In terms of colostrum evaluation, there are two ways you can do that on farm, and both are pretty uh, quick and easy. The first one is uh, using something called a colostrometer, which is shown here. It's that this little glass instrument here. Um, that estimates specific gravity of the colostrum, which is uh, correlated with um, uh, antibody concentrations, which is what this figure is showing here. Um, and this is a method that's been around since the 80s. Uh, so that's a pretty traditional, um, traditionally accepted method of colostrum evaluation. One of the issues with using a colostrometer is that temperature as well as fat content of the colostrum can affect the reading. So that's why, um, you know, it, it can be kind of a finicky way of assessing colostrum quality. The other method, which is uh, more, uh, you know, newer, I guess, um, is using something called a BRICS refractometer, which evaluates total solids of the colostrum. Um, and that is associated with um, antibody levels as well, which is what this figure is showing here. Um, it measures the measurement that a brick refractometer uh, gives you is something called percent bricks. Um, so as percent bricks increases, the average uh, or the uh, immunoglobulin or antibody concentration in the colostrum increases. So generally, we want to see a bricks of at least 22%, and that relates to that 50 milligrams per mil. IgG recommendation that I mentioned previously is our threshold for good quality colostrum. So either method is acceptable. Colostrometers can be purchased for you know, 30 or $40. Brix refractometers can be anywhere from 50, you know, 50 to over $300, depending on um, the features that it has and, and other things you can do with it. So um, both would be good investments uh, for the CAF program. Something that a lot of times comes up is the discussion about colostrum replacer and its uh, value versus, uh, in terms of you know, how it measures up to maternal colostrum. There was a study that was recently done where they, it was a really large study, they looked at 1,200 calves um, where they were fed colostrum replacer or um, high quality pooled maternal colostrum that measured um, over 60 grams per mil, uh, IgG per mil. And they fed both of, um, both of these within an hour of birth, so really close to birth, as, as, which is what we want. Um, they basically didn't see any difference in efficiency of antibody absorption. They didn't see any differences in the likelihood of calves getting treated for di diarrhea, respiratory disease, or fever. And they didn't see any differences in death loss. Um, so in terms of health, it seems that uh, colostrum replacer does a pretty good job. Um, they also saw, they did see slightly, differences in terms of um, the antibody levels in the blood after 24 hours of birth. So the calves fed the maternal colostrum, um, had 23 milligrams per mil versus 20 um, in the colostrum replacer group. But neither of those would be indications that, you know, that passive transfer, that absorption of antibodies was insufficient in either case. Um, what we use to measure that is we basically will look at blood concentrations of antibodies um, at 24 hours of after birth, and if it's above 10, um, that's what we like to see. So both of, in both cases, using the colostrum replacer or the maternal colostrum, we did they did see, um, you know, sufficient antibody absorption. Um, they they did see that the calves fed the colostrum replacer had slightly lower um, gains um, before weaning versus um, the calves that were fed the maternal colostrum, but that was a pretty small difference as well. Um, so. In summary, colostrum replacer is a good consistent source of immunoglobulins or antibodies, which can be really useful when there's insufficient quantity of good quality clean colostrum. Um, so if you have, you know, a first lactation heifer that doesn't produce enough colostrum or, you know, it's not of good quality, colostrum replacer may be an option if you don't have, you know, stored maternal colostrum in your freezer. Uh, there are many different colostrum replacer products out there, so it can be kind of and I guess confusing and you know 
to decide what one's the best. Um, generally, the recommendation is to just choose one that has clinically demonstrated efficacy. Um, so it's been shown to be effective in independently controlled studies, um, generally you know, by a third party institution, by university, um, what have you. So that's in terms of choosing one, that's the route you should go. Um, the other aspect of colostrum management is the amount that is fed. Um, for fresh or frozen colostrum, the general recommendation is to feed about 10% of the calf's birth weight. Um, and the blanket recommendation is gonna be three to four liters within two to four hours. Um, again, closer to you know, birth is, is ideal, but within two to four hours is, is acceptable. Um, so for an 80 pound Holstein calf or a 90 pound calf, that's gonna be anywhere around four liters or four quarts or four, uh, four to four and a half liters of colostrum based on this 10% of birth weight standard here. If you're feeding colostrum replacer uh, to mix, you make sure you follow the mixing instructions on the bag as to how much water to add. And basically you wanna to strive to deliver at least two doses of colostrum replacer, um, each of them containing 100 grams of um, IgG or antibodies um, per feeding. So the bag will tell you um, how much to feed to achieve your, you know, the desired amount. So in terms of storing colostrum, this can be really useful. Uh, most dairy producers already do this, but it's a good idea to store colostrum from cows that produce to, you know, more than enough for their calf or if it's really good quality. Um, you can also store, you know, milk, you know, colostrum or transition milk from cows from, you know, their first or second or third milking after colostrum production. Um, but it's really important that if you're going to store it, store it right away. Um, if you're not going to feed it within an hour, make sure you either put it in a refrigerator or put it in the freezer. Um, because if you leave it sitting out, it's going to grow bacteria and we don't want that. Um, make sure when you store it, you're labeling the container with the cow ID, the date, as well as the milking number if it's not first milking. Um, in the refrigerator, it can be stored for up to 24 hours. And in the freezer, it's good for up to a year. Um, when you put it in the freezer, a lot of people have different ways, you know, that they prefer to freeze it. Some people like to use uh, jugs or jars. Um, I like to use the gallon Ziploc bag method. So you put an aliquot in, you know, enough for one feeding or, you know, what have you, um, lay it flat, freeze it, um, and then it stores really nicely. And then when you go to thaw, it, it thaws pretty quickly as well. Um, to thaw colostrum, we generally want to submerge it into warm water. Um, uh, less than 120 degrees Fahrenheit. We don't want really hot water because that can damage the antibodies. Um, the other option is to use a microwave. Um, this is less than ideal, but if that's what you want to do, then that's, it can work. Um, we just recommend that you use the lowest setting possible and do it in short increments um, and either remove the thawed portion in between increments or mix it really well to make sure that those thawed portions aren't getting overheated because again, that, can, that excessive heat can damage the antibodies. And once thawed, you want to make sure that you're feeding the colostrum within one hour, um, and then do not refreeze thawed colostrum. You basically either have to feed it or get rid of it. Another thing that often comes up in terms of colostrum management is whether or not to tube feed calves. Um, some farms religiously will tube feed every calf its colostrum meal. Other farms prefer to bottle feed it, and then they tube feed if it's if it doesn't, you know, drink efficiently. Um, research doesn't really show, um, pro, you know one method's better than the other. Um, one of the benefits of tube feeding colostrum is that you do ensure complete and adequate delivery of all of that colostrum. So, you know, four liters can be a lot um, for a calf to drink in a bottle, especially if it's kind of slow or if it had a difficult calving. Um, <clears throat> so it can be useful to um, use tube feeding in that case. Um, in terms of um, a standard delivery method, tube feeding obviously is much more standardized um, you know, especially if you have the variability in terms of, you know, how much a calf, how well the calf's going to drink. Um, and if you have other people, several people in charge of the calf program, it can be useful to tube feed because then it's more consistent across employees um, than bottle feeding. I have a question mark in terms of labor intensivity because it really depends on, on the calf and the proficiency of the person who's tubing the calf. Um, bottle feeding can go, it can be really quick if a calf drinks really well. Um, but it can also be really slow um, and it might take, you know, several attempts to get the calf to consume all of its colostrum. So it can be more intensive in some cases. Um, in terms of equipment and, and training, obviously tube feeding is a skill. It's not super difficult, but you do need to be trained and you do need to be proficient in how to do it properly. 
Um, and you do need some specialized equipment to do that. Um, so at the end of the day, um, tube feeding or, or bottle feeding is fine, um, but if a calf won't nurse the bottle to drink a full colostrum feeding, within that two to four hour mark, it's a good idea to just tube feed it to make sure it gets its colostrum. Um, there was one study that was done recently that looked at tube uh, feeding versus bottle feeding. They fed uh, colostrum replacer and they didn't find any differences in um, antibody absorption rate or nutrient absorption rate um, within two days of, um, of birth. So again, the end of the day, um, either method is appropriate um, and just use the feeding method that works best for you and your farm. There are several other qualities of colostrum that are important um, and in, in addition to the antibodies. The first is gonna be obviously nutrients, proteins, fats, and sugars, which are needed for energy. Um, hormones and growth factors are also present in colostrum and those um, are suspected to be useful in regulating intestinal development. Um, as the calf grows and, and help it to start absorbing nutrients. Um, and there's other bioactive components of colostrum that are suspected to have some antimicrobial properties. Um, so again, colostrum isn't just about antibodies. Um, there is some new work out there looking at the value of transition milk and feeding that. So that's gonna be the milk that's produced in between colostrum and you know when it gets to the composition of whole milk. So would be milkings one, through two or three after, um, after colostrum production. So um, this table is showing um, kind of how the composition of the milk changes from colostrum and when it gets to um, whole milk. So um, fat content decreases a bit, protein content decreases quite a bit. Um, and then there's other nutrients like uh, say vitamin A, E and B12 drops uh, tremendously between colostrum and, and whole milk here, but you see that even in this transition, this transmit transition milk, these uh, for uh, second and third milkings, um, those uh, components are pretty high relative to whole milk. So um, that might have some uh, benefits to the calf if uh, when they feed, feed that to the calf. Um, so ones that to look at too are these growth factors, so IGF one as well as insulin, which is a hormone. Um, both of those decrease um, pretty uh, pretty dramatically between colostrum as well as uh, or in comparison to whole milk. So there might, might be some um, benefits to calf performance when if you feed these to calves um, during those first couple of feedings in addition to uh, the first feeding of colostrum. Um, another kind of getting away from colostrum management for a little bit. Some other things to do within that first 24 hours. The first thing is gonna be to disinfect the navel. Um, a lot of farms don't do this, but it's important because um, that umbilical cord tissue um, provides direct access for bacteria to enter the calf's bloodstream. So if you calve indoors or in a dirt lot or in a pen, which many of us do, um, we wanna make sure that we are dipping the navel to reduce um, pathogen exposure. Um, it's recommended to use a 7% tincture of iodine within 24 hours, but um, there are other non-iodine based um, navel dips out there that work effectively as well. Um, it's important to use a cup or some sort of dipping device to apply the dip um, and as opposed to a spray um, because that uh, using a cup helps to ensure complete coverage of the tissue. Um, a no return teat dip cup works really well for this. Um, just make sure that you do clean it in between calves so you're not transferring pathogens. <clears throat> it's important to identify calves after birth. Generally, this is accomplished using an ear tag. Um, RFID tag is fine. Um, just some ways so that you know what, you know, who the calf is. Um, this is really important for record keeping. Some good things to put on a tag obviously would be the calf's number, um, the registration number, if it's registered, the cow number, um, and the birthday. Those are some helpful things to put on a tag. Um, the other thing we want to look for in the first 24 hours is making sure the calf is uh, dry. Um, the cow might lick the calf off after birth. Um, most cows will do this. Some cows are not very good at this. Um, this helps to stimulate calf activity and it also helps to dry the calf to reduce cold stress because obviously they're going from inside the cow, which is about 100, 101 degrees, and they're going outside. Even if it's a warm day, it's still um, a bit of a temperature shock for them. Um, if the cow won't lick the calf off or if you desire uh, immediate separation, which is fine, um, you just want to make sure that you dry the calf off with uh, clean towels 
um, and then move it to a clean, protected, uh, well-bedded pen so it's not you know, in a drafty, cold, windy environment. Um, during cold weather, it can be useful to use heat lamps or other supplemental heat. It's just important to make sure that you're using them under you know, close supervision and they're not touching bedding or, or the calf because that does present a fire hazard. All right, so we're gonna switch gears and go a little bit of, uh, go through um, some, some things to look at, you know, day two through weaning. First area we're gonna talk about is nutrition. Um, for the pre-weaning calf nutrition program, our goals should be to achieve adequate growth um, while adapting the calf to solid feeds, which can help to develop the rumen to prepare it for weaning. And the important thing to remember with calf nutrition is that consistency is key. And this is particularly important when we talk about milk feeding. Um, so just a little bit of basic nutrition, um, the total nutrient requirement of a calf, so it's total energy requirement or it's total protein requirement, um, consists of two different components. It has to have nutrients to maintain itself, so for maintenance, and it also has to have nutrients for growth. Um, an animal must meet its, uh, its, its maintenance requirements before any growth can occur. Um, and the maintenance requirements of a calf is going to depend on its size as well as its environmental conditions. Um, so this figure is showing the energy requirement of calves. So this is just for maintenance, not for growth, um, under three weeks of age. So the lower critical temperature of young calves is around 68 degrees Fahrenheit. If it gets colder than that, they start to become cold stress and they do require a little bit more energy to stay warm. Um, so you can see as temperature decreases, so it's kind of backwards, but so it's going from 68 to minus four degrees Fahrenheit energy requirements are gonna increase regardless of how large the calf is. This is a 100 pound calf, this is an 80 pound calf, and this is a 60 pound calf. Um, so this is just important to think about when you're thinking about a feeding program and you're trying to achieve different growth rates, right? Um, if you're feeding, you know, at 68 degrees, you're feeding, you know, three megacalories of energy, that's just fine, this, this calf's gonna grow well, but if it drops down into, you know, the 20s, um, then all of a sudden you're gonna lose the energy that you could be using for growth. It's gonna to be toward, it's gonna to be diverted toward keeping the calf warm. Similar story when we have calves that are older than three weeks. Um, I just wanted to point out the lower critical temperature of calves that are older than three weeks is around 50 degrees. So it, they do um, have a little bit of an advantage when they become a little older. So the takeaway from this is that, you know, as temperature drops below 68 degrees for young calves or 50 degrees for older calves, more energy is needed for maintenance or else their growth rate is gonna suffer. Um, requirements for growth are gonna depend on the level of growth that you want from your calves. The Dairy Calf and Heifer Association has a target for pre-weaning calf growth and that is to double birth weight by 60 days of age. Um, so this chart here is just showing, you know, expected rate of growth to double birth weight depending on how big your calves are at birth. So for an average Holstein, it the growth rate would be around 1.3 to 1.8 you know, five um, pounds per day in order to achieve that, that goal. Um, but even as a constant growth rate, total requirements um, increase as a calf grows because they are also getting bigger. Um, so this figure is show, just showing um, energy requirements as calves age, um, depending, or as they get bigger, depending on their growth rate. So obviously a calf that's gaining one pound per day is gonna need less energy than a calf that's growing, you know, 1.3 pounds per day. But in general, both are gonna have increasing requirements as they get bigger. Um, whole milk versus milk replacer. This is a lot, you know, this is always debated when we talk about a, a pre-weaning uh, calf feeding program. Um, but in terms of comparison uh, for, a whole, for an average Holstein um, on a dry basis, her milk is gonna be about 25% protein and 31% fat, um, which is going to supply around 2.4 megacalories or units of energy per pound of dry matter. If you compare that to some milk replacers, so a 2020 milk replacer on a dry basis, that's gonna supply about 2.1 megacalories of energy per pound. Um, but if we look at a 2820 milk replacer, that's 28 protein, 20% 20 fat, um, it's only a little bit higher because you know fats, uh, the fat content's about the same. Um, it's only gonna be about 2.15 megacalories of energy per pound. So the takeaway from this is that milk, whole milk is gonna be more energy dense. So a lot of times calves do, do sometimes grow a bit faster on whole milk because they're getting more energy. Um, consistency can be an issue with whole milk if you're not feeding it from the bulk tank. Um, if you're using waste milk or milk from treated cows or from fresh cows or what have you, um, consistency can be a huge issue um, for, for the calves. 
Milk replacer, on the other hand, is generally consistent as long as your measuring and mixing protocols are consistent. And we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. Um, I mentioned this with colostrum, but it's the same, the same is true for whole milk. If you're not pasteurizing it, the risk for disease transmission as well as infection is, is higher um, than, than it is for milk replacer. And then in terms of an economic advantage, um, this is obviously going to depend on the farm, but as well as um, you know, the price of milk and what have you and, and the expected growth rate change you might have doing one program versus the other. So um, those are just things to think about when if you're considering whole milk versus a milk replacer program. Um, again, whole milk is more energy dense. So these are for our calves. If they're gaining one pound or 1.3 pounds a day, these are their energy requirements. So uh, the amount of energy required for a 90 pound calf who's gaining uh, 1.3 pounds per day is around maybe three and a half megacalories per day. For whole milk, you're gonna to need to feed one and a half pounds on a dry basis. For milk replacer, you're gonna to need to feed 1.7 pounds on a dry basis in order to achieve or to meet those, those requirements. <clears throat> so um, in terms of milk replacer, there's some things to remember if, uh, with feeding that. Um, the powder to water ratio really matters. I know some folks don't really think it does, um, but too much of either will alter the solids content and um, which can cause um, digestive issues and predisposed calves to bacterial infections. And this has to do with the osmolarity of, of the milk uh, when you feed it. Um, it's recommended that milk replacer is mixed to contain 12 and a half percent solids. Um, so to do that, um, the amount of water you're gonna mix with the powder is gonna depend on how much powder you are feeding per day. So um, this chart is just showing um, various amounts of powder depending on the type of feeding program that you're following and the amount of water that should be mixed in order to achieve that 12 and a half percent solids. Um, so for a say mod moderate type feeding program, um, if you're feeding one and a half pounds of powder per day, you're gonna need to mix that with five quarts of water. And that's just for a whole day. So if you're dividing that into two feedings a day, that means it's you know three quarters of a pound of powder and two and a half quarts of water. If it's a three times a day feeding routine, it is half a pound of powder and around 1.7 quarts um, per feeding. Um, it's important when you're uh, doing the milk replacer to um, measure properly um, so that you're achieving that consistent 12 and percent solids mixture. Um, in terms of proper measurement, powder should be weighed using a scale for most accurate results. I know it's most people like to use the cup that comes with the, 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 the powder, um, but it's better to weigh it. It's more accurate. It's more consistent. And then for the water, um, you can measure it using a, a liquid measuring device and then you know, mark a container or what have you so that you get a consistent amount of water um, whenever you, when you do mix the milk replacer. Um, it's important to use warm water, so between 110 and 120 degrees Fahrenheit to help with the mixing. And then it's also important to clean all utensils and um, buckets, bottles, things like that after each feeding. Um, obviously, because you don't want to transfer pathogens between calves, but also any milk residue left over can um, create a prime breeding ground for bacteria and other pathogens. In terms of pre-weaning growth um, and its impact on milk yield, there's a lot of new research coming out in this area. Um, it appears uh, that there, uh, you know, increasing pre-weaning growth can be associated with first lactation milk yield. So higher growth rates before weaning can generally, uh, uh, has been shown to increase first lactation yield. Um, a, a review that was done a couple of years ago showed that um, a one pound increase in pre-weaning average daily gain was associated with an increase in first lactation milk yield of between 1,800 and 3,400 pounds. So that's a pretty big difference there. Um, but obviously you're not generally gonna make small adjustments to achieve a one pound difference in your pre-weaning growth rates. Um, but to apply this in a more you know, practical example, um, so let's say your farm, you know, your first lactation cows produce 20,000 pounds um, and their pre-weaning growth rate is around 1.5 pounds per day. If you bumped up your pre-weaning growth rate to 1.8 pounds per day by, you know, feeding more, uh, you know, a higher level of milk replacer or what have you, you would expect your milk, uh, first lactation milk yield to increase by between 500 and 1,000 pounds. Whether or not this is economically feasible uh, would obviously have to be determined on a per farm basis. Um, obviously, you'd have to weigh the effects of, or you know, the, the costs of feeding additional milk replacer and, and things to get that that better growth, um, as well as the 
amount of um, the value of the milk that's going to be the result of that increased growth. Um, so there is some some support there for for better growth rates pre weaning and and its benefits on milk yield. Uh, we're going to talk start to talk a little bit about some solid feeding, um, but I just want to remind you about calf um, the calf intestinal or, you know stomach and and how it forms and how what it looks like as the calf grows. So when a calf is born, the uh, large port, largest portion of the stomach is going to be the abomasum or that fourth compartment, which is functioning very similar to a true stomach. So that's going to be similar to our stomach. So you know, so the 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 calf is when it's born, it's going to be more similar to a monogastric animal like a pig or a human. Um, that's why a calf can utilize milk so well, and it doesn't utilize forage so well. Um, but as the calf grows, the rumen starts to develop. Again, the rumen is really important for digesting forages. Um, and that's where um, I like to say the magic happens. Um, so um, as the calf starts to get older, the rumen becomes more developed. It can start, it can use for, forages and other solid feeds better. And then a mature animal is going to have um, the stomach capacity is going to be about 80% of the is going to be the rumen and about 8% is going to be the abomasum. And at that point, obviously the calf is going to rely more on um, digestion in the rumen than it does in the abomasum. So our goal for a pre-weaning calf program is to develop the rumen so that we can um, start to feed solid feeds and, and rely less on milk. Um, fermentation of solid feeds in the rumen is what generates um, factors that are important for rumen maturation. So volatile fatty acids, acetate, propionate, and butyrate are important. Um, obviously, the, they, they help the calf to, they, they are absorbed by the, calf, the, by the calf so that they can use them for energy sources, but um, butyrate in particular is very important for rumen development. So rapidly fermentable feeds like grain um, produce both butyrate and propionate, um, but butyrate, as I said, is key for rumen development. Um, grain intake is critical um, for, for initiating that rumen development because of that butyrate uh, production. Um, and so this figure, this picture, um, I pulled from Penn State um, researchers because it shows really nicely what happens to the rumen if you feed different types of diets to, to pre weaned calves. So um, a calf that's fed an only milk diet, this is what the rumen wall looks like. Uh, a milk and grain diet, you can see these bumps and ridges. Those are called papillae, and those are really important for um, absorption, you know, rumen function and absorption of nutrients. And then you have a calf that was filled, filled, uh, fed milk and hay only. So again, you can see that the, the key component here is the grain, and that is what is critical for rumen development. So talking about starter grain, we recommend feeding that is, or offering it at least uh, at a couple of you know, when the calf's only a couple of days old, so it starts to explore around. Um, it might, you know, get a mouthful here and there. Um, but our goal should be to achieve around two pounds of starter grain consumption um, per day uh, for three consecutive days before we initiate weaning. And that makes sure that the, obviously that helps, you know, simulate rumen development, but also make sure that the calf is able to consume that feed and it knows where it is so that when you take its milk away, it's still able to um, get nutrients. Um, there are two major types of starter grains out there. There's a texturized starter, uh, which is shown here, and there's also a pelleted starter. Um, both are fine, but uh, most industry folks will recommend a coarse texturized starter um, because it does encourage earlier rumen development than a pelleted starter. And then sometimes pelleted starters um, can induce uh, rumen acidosis, so it can reduce the pH of the rumen because they are fermented so, so quickly. And that becomes more problematic as the calves get older and they start to consume more starter as they get closer to weaning. Um, something that comes up a lot when we talk about pre-weaning nutrition is uh, forage, whether or not calves should be given forage. Um, this has been debated for many, many, many years, and it's still not settled. Um, but uh, essentially, as I mentioned, starter grain is the key for rumen development. So a lot of folks will say that forage isn't needed. Um, some recent studies do suggest that it can be beneficial in some cases. Um, and it, so in some of these studies, they're offering it up to 10% of the diet. Um, and it might be beneficial to help alleviate any acidosis that develops as a consequence of those calves consuming more grain as they get closer to weeding. So in instances where um, calves are older, so three to five weeks of age, um, starter intake is over one and a half pounds a day, or if they're eating a starter that's either finely ground, heat treated or pelleted, feeding forage might be um, advantageous in those situations because it might help alleviate that as uh, potential acidosis. But again, it's important that 
with the forage feeding that you're not feeding too much um, because if you feed too much, obviously that takes up space in the stomach and that can compete for um, starter intake, which again, as I mentioned, starter intake is what we really need for that rumen development. The last part of nutrition I just wanna mention is water. Um, it is the first essential nutrient for all animals. Um, so it's really important that water is not forgotten about, um, fresh water, obviously. Um, we wanna make sure we're offering it as early as possible. Um, the uh, National Dairy Farm Program um, ha has a requirement of offering it by day three, but it's not just from a welfare standpoint, there are production benefits to offering water earlier. Um, there um, has been research that shows that calves will consume about four pounds of water for every pound of starter grain. So if water's not limited or if water's not available, it's gonna really limit their starter intake. Um, and there's also a recent study that was done that looked at the effect of giving water at birth versus at 17 days of age, so waiting a few weeks. Um, those calves that were given water at birth had, had greater uh, post-weaning size as well as greater body weight at five months of age. So that the idea of water, offering water has, has you know, implications for beyond the, after weaning even. So um, offer water earlier, early, as early as possible. All right, we're gonna go through a little bit about housing next. Um, and the thing about calf housing that's really important is, some, is ventilation. So um, it's critical for respiratory disease management as well as prevention, um, especially in barns. Um, I know a lot of uh, folks in our area, a lot of times we have, we don't have big calf barns that we build specifically for calves. We have old you know, stanchion barns and whatnot that we use for calf barns. So ventilation can become a big issue in these situations if we're not careful. Um, Ideally, we prefer natural ventilation, um, but sometimes supplemental air movement, you know, by fans and what have you is necessary, um, particularly during um, summer, but also during certain times of day, um, you know, in the, in the midday um, when, when things aren't, when there's not enough um, natural airflow. A good uh, system is going to provide fresh air for the calves, but it's also going to remove excess heat, moisture, and dust, as well as harmful pathogens and volatilized gases. And it's going to do all of this without put, um, making it too drafty for the calves. Um, so the recommendation rates um, that they have for pre weaned calves is during cold weather, they want at least four air exchanges per hour. Um, during mild weather, they want at least 12 air exchanges per hour. And then during hot weather, you want 60 air exchanges per hour. Um, and then there's some new research going on in this area to kind of, you know, make these a little bit more, more precise in terms of um, recommendations for pre weaned calves. So this is kind of a uh, revitalized area of, of research. In terms of bedding, there's um, three main purposes, I guess, of bedding. It should be clean and dry, but it, the purpose of bedding is obviously to create a clean and sanitized, uh, you know, sanitary environment. Um, it's also important for uh, comfort, but it's also really important for body temperature regulation. Um, and this is particularly important for those young calves and especially important during colder weather. Um, during colder weather, we want to provide deep bedding so that the calves can nest, is what they call it, um, which helps to kind of insulate them and um, keep them warmer. Um, the University of, Ma uh, of Ma uh, yeah, the University of Wisconsin um, at Madison has a, a nesting score system that they use um, to um, assess how deep or how efficient a bed the bedding is in keeping the calves warm. A nesting score of one is where the calf lays down and the rear leg is completely visible. So a sawdust situation, obviously um, in most cases, the score is gonna be a one. Um, a score of two is where the rear leg is partially visible and a score of three is where the rear leg is not visible. So this would be a score of three here. The calf is nestled down in that straw and that's really good, especially during cold weather. Um, another thing with bedding is to ensure that there's good drainage. I mentioned that it has to be um, not just clean but it also has to be dry. Wet bedding is a breeding ground for um, bacteria, but also flies, especially in the summertime. Um, and if you have poor drainage underneath the bedding, um, you're going to need a lot more bedding. Um, you're going to have to add a lot more bedding more frequently in order to keep it dry. Um, so sawdust and straw are used quite frequently, um, but they do retain moisture. So um, they're not recommended to be used as a base. So at the, for the bottom part of the calf pen, um, gravel works really well, but if that's not an option, I know a lot of us use, you know, have concrete on the bottom. Um, it's good if there's at least a slope um, to encourage drainage either into a gutter or something to that effect. Um, otherwise, you're going to be needing to use a lot of bedding to keep things dry. Um, 
there are three kind of you know, major types of bedding that are used. The first is sawdust, um, which is readily available, easy to manage. It doesn't allow for nesting. So in the, in the cold winter months, it might not be the best choice. And it does retain moisture. So again, that's, uh, if it's not kept dry, it, becomes, it can become an issue in terms of um, cleanliness. Straw is another option. It's readily available. Um, it's good for cold weather because it does help with that nesting. And it does, like sawdust, retain moisture. Um, another option is sand which can be kind of difficult to manage, but it does um, provide good sanitation and drainage, um, but it's, and it's also good for hot weather, very much like it is for um, mature cows. Um, something that oftentimes comes up with bedding, or sorry, uh, with uh, housing is um, the hutch versus the individual pens in a barn debate. Um, if managed really well, so good ventilation, good bedding management, individual pens in a calf barn can be advantageous. Um, there was one study that uh, looked at a, a huge, I forget how many calves, a very large study, where they looked at um, calves housed in a hutch versus um, bedded pe uh, pens. Calves um, in, a, in, the, in, the, in the barn um, actually had higher um, daily gains than, than in the hutch during cold weather. Um, uh, a different study by the same group actually looked at um, calf housing and in individual pens versus uh, with straw versus outdoor hutches, but it was sand during the summer. Um, and surprisingly, the calves in the barn with the straw actually had better daily gains, better starter intake, and better fecal scores. Um, so the take home from this is that either is fine, um, but, if, and if, but if you really want to have an indoor, um, you know, indoor system with individual pens, you need to make sure that it is well ventilated. Um, if you don't have a well ventilated calf barn with well drained pens, um, any possible advantages that system would have over a hutch um, is probably going to be lost. So um, in terms of the last thing I want to mention about uh, housing is this issue of group housing. This has become kind of a topic that's um, that's been you know visited quite a bit quite a bit recently. Um, group housing, when we talk about that with pre-weaned calves, we're generally thinking about pairs or small groups. Um, so group size is less than seven. I'm not talking about housing, you know, with an auto feeder. I'm just talking about in general, um, you know, people that are still bottle feeding or bucket feeding their calves. Um, but there are um, some studies that are a lot of studies that are showing some benefits for um, calf social learning um, in terms and, and as it as it applies to group housing. So um, you might be thinking, like, what does that even mean? Um, so basically, calves and and ruminants in general are they learn what to eat and how to eat by watching each other. So a calf that's raised in a group will see other calves eating and it will either one be stimulated to go up and eat, but it will also say, oh, what is this? Should I eat it kind of thing? Um, so studies do show that calves that are housed in groups oftentimes will have better starter intake. And a lot of times that translates into better uh, body weight gains. Um, there's also studies that show um, that group housed calves are more quote unquote flexible and are able to cope with stressful situations better. Obviously, this has, has implications for weaning. Um, so calves that um, are housed together a lot of times will have better uh, post weaning performance. Um, group transitions, so any stressful event during the calf's life, so group transitions, or even um, there's not really any studies that are looking at this, but this might have implications for um, long-term effects on how a cow interacts with herd mates and also how it deals with the transition period and things like that. Um, there's very little research out there that shows any negative effects of this management approach on performance, so growth and, and feed intake. So um, that's why group housing is, is becoming kind of something that people are starting to really, really think about. There are a lot of challenges associated with group housing, though. Um, obviously, the one that comes to mind is disease transmission. That's one of the biggest reasons why we uh, you know, traditionally would keep calves separate is to minimize disease transmission among calves. Um, but disease transmission can be managed um, with good housing management. So good ventilation, um, you know, not overstocking the calf pens, um, providing good, clean, good, dry, clean bedding, um, and things like that, that can help, you know, eliminate some of those issues that might be a problem with, with group housing. There are inconsistent results in the scientific literature um, in terms of disease transmission rates with group housing systems, which indicates obviously, again, that management is really, really important and it can have a big impact on, on how successful the system is. Um, stocking density um, is important 
for preventing disease transmission. So there should be at least three and a half square feet per calf. Um, if there's not, then you could have issues with disease transmission because of that. And then it's important to keep uh, groups relatively small. So um, there was a study that showed that, you know, kind of a, the break point is around seven calves per group. Um, anything more than that, they oftentimes will have an increased um, uh, rate of disease incidence. Um, also, um, another reason why, you know, we have calves in indiv individual pens is so that we can monitor them individually, so we can detect any early signs of illness. This is still possible with group housing. It just takes a little bit more work. You have to pay a little bit closer attention to the calves at feeding time, you know, making note of any, any animal that's not, you know, behaving normally. Um, competition at feeding time, especially when you're, you know, giving milk, um, that can be an issue. Um, so in these situations, if there's a way to kind of separate calves or, you know, re, you know restrain them or what have you um, during milk feeding, that can be helpful as well. Um, so some common options for group housing would be, um, the one that comes to mind is a super hutch. Um, there's a couple calves in here. Um, something that is relatively new in, in concept is the idea of using a double hutch system. So you have two hutches next to each other and then you just would make this one big common area where the calves can co-mingle. And that's helpful in terms of, of, of um, and, and in terms of, uh, you know, pair housing calves. And then also you can use pens um, with a couple of calves in it here. All right, we're gonna finish up with weaning um, and just talk a little bit about that. In terms of timing, uh, weaning can generally occur by six to eight weeks of age. Um, and you should wean, wean based on grain consumption, not the age of the animal. Um, I know a lot of us like to use the age, but um, the important factor is the grain consumption. Um, we wanna make sure that they're eating at least two pounds of starter um, per day for three consecutive days. Um, and at that point, we can initiate weaning. Um, the USDA um, in 2014 reported um, some different management practices of, of the national dairy herd, um, but they basically broke down um, you know, average weaning age by farm size. Um, and this is age in weeks. So very small farms, so less than 30 head weaned around 12 weeks of age versus large farms that were closer to nine weeks of age. And on average, all farms um, weaned around nine weeks. And then in terms of percent of farms that are have had calves weaned by nine weeks, um, about 50% of our really, really small farms um, had calves weaned by nine weeks. Um, whereas our large farms had calves weaned by nine weeks, about 63% of them. So overall about 70% of farms in the, in the US will wean by nine weeks or less. There are a couple, uh, two main types of weaning methods. The first is abrupt weaning, which is the traditional way of doing things. Um, and then there's the gradual weaning process, um, which is preferred because it generally does produce better post weaning performance of calves. So with abrupt weaning, obviously you're basically removing all of the milk at once. With gradual weaning, that's more of a, um, a slow process. There's really two approaches to this. You can basically cut down to once a day feeding for you know, a week to 10 days um, or some variation of time. The other option is to do what we call a step down process, which involves gradually reducing milk feedings by a certain percentage each day for a period of time. So an example of this could be a 10 day step down procedure where you reduce the milk allowance by 50% each day for 10 days and then completely stop milk feeding from there. Um, last but not least, I just want to address some additional weaning tips. Um, we always hear that weaning is really stressful, so it's important to avoid combining weaning with other stressful events like dehorning, vaccination, um, pen moves, um, and also introduction to completely new feeds. So it's important that calves during the weaning process and after have access, access to some of the same feeds that they were given before weaning. Um, and it's also important to keep a close eye on calves during this time to make sure that they're behaving normally and coming up to eat and, and not getting dehydrated and hydrated and things like that. So uh, just some final thoughts for today. Um, there is no one size fits all system that's gonna work for everybody. So um, success is gonna vary, of, of some of these approaches is going to vary from farm to farm. There are two major critical points in a calf's life. The first is that 24 hour period. The second is gonna be weaning. Um, so we spent quite a bit of time talking about those areas. Um, consistency is very important for the feeding program. Um, this not only um, is applied to you know, grain feeding, but it's also really important for the milk feeding program.
And also close attention to detail and calf behavior can help you to detect um, potential health issues early. So make sure you're always keeping an eye on calves, um, especially at feeding time. And with that, we'll take any questions. If there are any, please put them in.